Hello and welcome to Leeds Echoes Walk Through Time, a special four part series designed to enhance your historical escapism whilst out walking in the city. A gentle ramble over four parts of Leeds that people often choose to escape to, whether for excitement or relaxation. Enjoy them at your own pace and in your own time, and I hope they leave you feeling that little better connected to the great city of Leeds. Welcome to Leeds City Centre, West Yorkshire's mini-metropolis. One million square feet of intense anthropogenic activity, and like most cities, a band of Mother Nature flows right through its centre, the River Air. Running parallel with both the river into and out of the city is the canal, the Leeds Liverpool entering from the west and the air and colder navigation from the east. These two waterways, one natural, the other man-made, bring wildlife and nature right into the heart of the city. From Leeds' two favourite swans, who have nested alongside the canal just west of the centre for years, to bats, kingfishers, and now even salmon, to name but a few. For many of us who live and work in the city centre, the green spaces fuelled by these waterways provide an essential link with nature something that recently has felt more important than ever. This podcast is designed to be a potential accompaniment to your strolls around the city, some inspiration to aid your escapism. It's not a walking tour per se, although I may suggest some short routes. You don't need to be in the city centre to listen. You don't even need to be in Leeds. The year leading up to this series creation has seen us reevaluate a lot of what we find important. And whilst we're all in this process of rearranging, I wanted to show people some of the things about the city that I've always valued and found enriching or fascinating. So with the help of both Heritage Open Days and Leeds Civic Trust, let's explore Leeds City Centre. So how and indeed why did the first town and then city of Leeds grow along this short stretch of river? And who were the people who drove this growth? Leeds has existed as a recorded settlement as far back as 730 AD, when the Venerable Bede, an English Benedictine monk and scholar, completed his ecclesiastical history of the English people and first mentioned the place Loidis. A little further back upstream, just under a thousand years ago, in 1152, a group of Cistercian monks founded Kirkstall Abbey establishing routes of trade which would help secure the city's future. The huge flock of sheep, for instance, tended to by the Abbey's monks, began Leeds's now near millennia long relationship with textiles. The Abbey's origin story is a curious one. Henry de Lacy, Lord Mayor of Pontefract, made a promise to God to build an abbey honouring the Virgin Mary should he survive a serious illness and de Lacy was the immediate descendant of French nobility who had taken part in the Norman conquests of England, hence his ownership of the land. And when he indeed survived his illness, he thought best to follow through on his promise, and the abbot and monks at Fountains Abbey in nearby Harrogate were only too happy to oblige. After all, the foundation of a new abbey would greatly benefit them as much as it would de Lacy. After a failed start in Barnaldswick, the monks moved to the heavily wooded area in the Air Valley, and as well as laying the foundations for Leeds' long relationship with textiles, the de Lacy family and the monks of Kirkstall arguably kick-started Leeds' other speciality, iron. They began iron production on a large and lucrative scale as far back as 1160, a tradition which continued on essentially the same spot until 2001 at Kirkstall Forge. And without the foundation of Kirkstall Abbey, it is quite possible that Leeds would not have developed in the way it did during the Middle Ages which ultimately paved the way for the city we know today. And by the 15th century, the small market town of Leeds was established. Protected by vast forests surrounding it on all sides, only the foolish would attempt to find it unaided and risk being attacked by, 
believe it or not, bears. I once read in a small Victorian pamphlet in the Central Library that the town would pay people to patrol the outskirts, giving correct directions to those they favoured and incorrect to those they wanted to keep away, sending them wandering into the Bearfield forest. That there were once bears in Leeds is certainly a fact. Unfortunately, our medieval ancestors hunted them to extinction. But the shady direction giving? That may well simply be a Victorian tall tale, but I adore it nonetheless. The cloth trade was born out of the Kirkstall monks' connections to European trading routes until the dissolution of the monasteries, when the market was flooded with land, cheap land, which Leeds' key merchants were keen to buy. The town rapidly became the region's centre of coordination for the textile trade, resulting in the construction of the first white cloth hall, under the influence of then Mayor Ralph Thorsby, on Kirkgate in 1711, one of the oldest streets in Leeds. And like much of Leeds' progression, it has been spurred on by rivalry with its neighbours. Wakefield had constructed a covered cloth hall but a year earlier in 1710 in an attempt to lure customers away from Leeds. And well, this simply wouldn't do. And despite the building's profound historical importance, it became so forgotten and so absorbed by surrounding structures and modifications that we actually lost it. I know it seems crazy, but we legitimately misplaced the entire building until as recently as the 1980s when we found out it was still there. And finally, in 2018, work to restore the once centre point of trade in Leeds to its former glory was started by Rushbond. And work is well underway, and already decades of neglect and highly questionable modifications are being peeled away to reveal a beautiful structure. Indeed, analysis of tree rings from one of the original roof trusses reveals it had been used for an entire 200 years in another building before being repurposed for the White Cloth Hall, the tree itself having been felled in the summer of 1470. Amazingly, this 500-year-old piece of wood weighing over three quarters of a tonne will be finding its way back into the finished restored building. Take a stroll down Kirkgate and admire it for yourself. And from the early 1700s and the first White Cloth Hall, growth in Leeds began to accelerate. Its relationship with textiles expanded, more cloth halls were built, and with it came greater trade and ultimately greater wealth flowing into the city. Unlike the free-flowing river air, however, this wealth was obviously diverted to the few rather than the many. And if you're walking around the city centre now whilst listening, there are still some architectural spectres from this century hiding in plain sight. Behind the corn exchange, on Assembly Street, are the appropriately named Assembly Rooms. Built in 1777 as an extravagant social destination for traders and gentry of the day, it was reportedly quite a spectacle. A short walk from here, on Boar Lane, is Holy Trinity Church, which dates from the 1720s and, rather poetically, has a very 21st century shrine, the Trinity Shopping Centre, wrapping and curving around its edges. For an even older slice of architectural delight, head north up Brigitte to St John the Evangelist Church. Walk through its triangular stone entrance just off New Brigitte and you are suddenly immersed in a tranquil green paradise. Built in the 1630s, it is the oldest church in the city. Now a redundant Anglican church, it is cared for by the church's conservation trust, and I absolutely insist that whenever you can, you take a peek inside, for here lies the building's true beauty. The city's core, however, its soul and spirit both architecturally and in turn geographically, is Victorian. A huge number of beautiful and unique Victorian buildings survive in the city centre, and for me, I've always presented the city's clearest and most honest face. From Kirkgate Market to the Corn Exchange, the LNER Railway Viaduct, the resplendent old post office and city square, and who could forget its elegant neighbour, the Majestic. The starting point of nearly every family in Leeds for generations, everyone's grandparents met at the Majestic. Wrapping itself from Wellington Street round to Quebec Street, the Majestic was built in the early 1920s as a cinema during the Great Picture House boom. It was the venue of countless first dates until its final screening in 1969, showing the good, the bad and the ugly. 
From there it became a bingo hall, then a nightclub, finally shutting its doors to the partygoers of Leeds in 2008. And now it's being redeveloped, despite a literal blaze of setbacks, into the new national headquarters of Channel 4. Another hopeful success story of why these buildings should be saved. I recommend you take a seat in City Square and admire it. And now if you are sitting here, it would be impossible for your eyes to miss the tower of white stone that is the Queen's Hotel. This elegant, art deco, grade two listed building dates from 1935, when the London, Midland and Scottish Railway, whose shield you can still see carved into the building, demolished its predecessor, which had stood since 1863. And intertwined with the hotel is Leeds Railway Station. Straddling the river air on an endless series of brick arches, it's an often overlooked engineering marvel from the Victorian Leodesians. Records suggest it took over 18 million bricks to build the dark arches in the viaduct. And round the back of the station, off Princess Square, is a set of steps which takes you down to the river. And from here you can stroll along its banks to the Whitehall pedestrian footbridge, installed in 2007. Here you can cross the river and reach the canal towpath, turn left and loop back towards the city centre. If you're lucky, you might catch a glimpse of the two famous swans who nest here. And from here you can stroll into the heart of what used to be a busy and bustling inland port, now reimagined as living, leisure and workspaces. I often walk through here and picture how different it must have been. The now usually perfectly still water, in a constant state of excitement. The smells, the sounds, the people. This spot is the starting point of a man-made canal which stretches 204 kilometres to Liverpool. I can always still feel the echo of Victorian Leeds here. And just across the water is another gem in Leeds' architectural crown. The beautiful red and orange-hued Italianate towers rising into the sky of tower works. Founded by T.R. Harding in order to manufacture steel pins used in carding and combing textiles, this was reflective of a lot of Leeds' heavy industry over the second half of the 19th century. Highly niche and specialised. The three towers served as dust extraction and were light years ahead of their time in terms of reducing pollution. And after many decades of neglect, the whole area is being redeveloped into living and workspace, due for completion in 2023. I'm incredibly excited to see this area get some much needed love. Those resplendent towers are the first thing that greets anyone arriving in Leeds by train from the east, and it is long overdue they had a new purpose. And if you've arrived in Leeds via train, your walk through the centre may well start with Ball Lane, and sitting proudly on its corner, with its green domed roof, is the former headquarters of the Yorkshire Banking Company. Resembling an observatory from the outside, the city's coat of arms sitting carved in stone above its front door. The original interior walls were a pale turquoise eggshell glazed tile with Numidian marble dado. It must have been breathtaking. Sadly, only two years after opening this grand building in 1899, the Yorkshire Banking Company was no more. It was absorbed by Midland Bank and for a long while it operated as a branch. The building then began a new life as somewhere to spend one's money rather than save it. And now you can pop in for some light refreshment and admire the still remarkable interior and gaze up at the beautiful gold and blue domed roof. In fact, gazing up is my best advice for Leeds. Often its architectural beauty lay just out of sight, hiding above a shop or a restaurant or a bar. As you walk further along Ball Lane, Another domed roof comes into view, this one much larger and much grander. It is, of course, none other than that of Leeds's Corn Exchange. Built between 1861 and 1863, it has been one of the jewels in Leeds's architectural crown for nearly 160 years. Inside is truly a wonder. The glass roof, both centrally and on the north-facing side, allow light in in such beautiful abundance. Originally for the purpose of thorough inspection of corn, today it provides a welcome relief and juxtaposition to the usually heavily artificially lit shopping centres of modern times. Connecting to Ball Lane is another of Leeds' oldest streets, Brigitte, 
stretching from Leeds Bridge down at the air, where Louis Le Prince filmed some of the first moving images sometime around 1888, Brigitte runs north, eventually intersecting the hedgerow. And running off either side of Brigitte was once a maze of yards and ginnels, housing the city's new and rapidly expanding working classes over the 18th and 19th century. And Brigitte has been pedestrianised since 1993 and has been Leeds' centre of trade and commerce for over 800 years. And fascinatingly, back in the early formations of the town nearly a thousand years ago, Brigitte represented the grafting of a new town onto the old. Unlike the residents of Kirkgate, bound under Holy Trinity, the burghers who rented land on the 65-foot-wide Brigitte were free men, encouraged to build their homes and workshops, keep animals, to live and trade there. And since the 1970s, Leeds has been trying to reclaim as much space in the centre as it can from the road network, gradually trying to reduce the number of vehicles. Depending on when you're listening, the newest phase of this ambition is roaring ahead, and there are times when the city feels like a never-ending construction site. But it will be worth it. The plans currently being executed will reclaim thousands of square feet of space from the highways agency and give it back to the citizens of Leeds via vast new public spaces. So far, the bulk of the work has concentrated on Leeds's newer main street, the Hedrow. And the Hedrow was constructed in the 1930s, widening the existing Park Lane and what was Guildford Street, a grand new main street for Leeds, all adhering to a strict design plan laid out by Sir Reginald Blumfeld. Its main aim was to improve traffic flow from east to west in the city. This newly widened thoroughfare took in some of Leeds's most important civic buildings, including the Town Hall and the Central Library. And the Central Library is an essential visit on any stroll around the city, even if just for a few moments. There is something so remarkable about it, to be able to freely walk its exquisitely designed corridors and stairwells, tracing the steps of thousands of people before you on their quest for knowledge and enlightenment. There's energy, there's an excitement to the building. And nothing could sum up Leeds's Yorkshire-born modesty more than the fact that it never renamed its town hall. Despite being a city since 1893, and neighbouring Bradford renaming their City Hall in 1965, Leeds, of course, never saw the need. The world and their dog knows what a great city Leeds is. Why bother with such unnecessary administration? And once upon a time, there was a large fountain outside the Town Hall. It had started life in the market, but was moved in front of the Town Hall in the late 19th century. The 34-foot-high, three-tiered Victorian fountain was... Removed sometime around 1905 and replaced with the statue of Queen Victoria, which currently sits in Woodhouse Moor, the fountain then seemed to disappear, with no one seemingly knowing what happened to it. A recent Twitter appeal revealed it was moved to Round Hay Park, however, all that remains today is perhaps some old pipework underwater. It was likely stripped down for its iron during the First World War. And now, of course, we have barely scratched the surface of Leeds's deep and rich history here. But I do hope what you've heard has stirred your appetite to find out more. Understanding the history of a place is to understand why it is the way it is. Why it looks and feels the way it does. And why the people are the way they are. And this is the information which truly connects a person to a place. Leeds belongs to all those who call it home. And in turn... We belong to Leeds. Thank you so much for listening to this special episode of Leeds Echoes. I'd like to give a huge thanks to both Leeds Civic Trust and the National Trust for both their confidence and support. In the meantime, stay safe, take care, and love where you live. <laughs> <laughs>